folks, Mythic ODM here. So DC20 launched last week and within four days hit the million dollar mark with over 12,000 backers. Currently, it sits at 1.3 million USD, which is, you know, something like 2 million Canadian. Again, my most sincere congratulations to the Dungeon Coach and his team. I can easily see this hitting, you know, 1.75 to 2 million by the end of the Kickstarter, which ends in the beginning of July. An astounding success. I would also like to thank the DC20 community for the 1,200 views and hundreds of likes and making my first video posted back in a few months, having the most comments on any of my videos to date. My little channel is only one of hundreds covering TTRPGs and gaining, you know, 10% more followers in one video was unexpected and very appreciated. So thank you to the DC20 community. Now, several folks asked that I make a comparison video with DC20 and Pathfinder 2E. Well, here it is. So I've been playing Pathfinder 2E for over a year now. My Twitch channel is running the Kingmaker series every other Sundays. And we are 30 episodes in. The group is around seventh level currently. So we do have a lot of play time as well as a lot of character creation time under our belts. And I do play in a couple other campaigns with newer players. And so I can see the game from both the GM and the player perspectives. When looking at DC20, it is very easy to compare it to fifth edition D&D. It is the basis of DC 20 after all, but there are a lot of concepts from Pathfinder. For those that are coming over, will understand and likely better than those just coming over from fifth edition. It's very easy for many just to claim that DC 20 is just another clone of 5e, but let's be honest, any TTRPG that uses a D20, has stats, hit points, etc., will always be considered a clone of Dungeons and Dragons. It is what I'd have to say, I'd guess 90% or more of the people who play TTRPGs are actually playing and it has mainstream popularity thanks to things like Critical Role, Stranger Things, Big Bang Theory, and others. I mean, they even mentioned it uh, in the latest Doctor Who episode called Rogue. And guess where Rogue came from? Yes, Dungeons and Dragons. It's a very blatant promotion of a set of, uh, a set of dice. There's a reason that both Daggerheart and the MCDM are avoiding using D20s as their base. But I digress. Let's chat about what DC20 pulls from Pathfinder 2E. Now, the one thing to note is that the Alpha 0.7 release, which there is a free download link on the Kickstarter page, and I will link to the Kickstarter in the description, only has rules for characters up to second level. At third level, characters gain subclasses, which are a 5E mechanic, and that is not in this Alpha. The Alpha also does not really go into exploration and downtime activities, which are terms ripped straight out of Pathfinder, but there are some nuggets we know from the Dungeon Coaches videos and things spoken about on the Discord. So we will not see level four characters until I believe it's beta 0.9, which they may release, they're estimating within a month of the Kickstarter closing. The team has stated that level five will likely not be until beta 0.11 which that is several months off. So again, please remember that this is all a work in progress. Dates are not set in stone, so bear that in mind. So let's go through the ABCs of character creation. In Pathfinder, this is Ancestries, Backgrounds, and Class. Now, as I've stated in my Pathfinder 2E character creation video, I look at it character, then Ancestry, and then finally a background. I like to look at, at the class I'd like to play, see what ancestry I envision, and then the background just kind of complements those choices. So in Pathfinder, your characters have the basic six stats like in 5e, and your choices of class, ancestry, and background modify the bonuses of these attributes. Now in DC20, you only have four stats, and they are might, agility, intelligence, and charisma. You either use an array, point by, or roll like in 5e or Pathfinder first edition. Your max modifier is plus three in DC 20, where in Pathfinder it maxes at plus four at low levels. Now, these maximums increase as you level, just like they do in Pathfinder and everything else. DC 20 will feature most of the classes you know from Pathfinder, the fighter, the wizard, the cleric, the rogue, the ranger, the bard, and the warlock, which is the witch in Pathfinder, and of course the druid. DC20 will also have the Monk, Sorcerer, and Barbarian, which Pathfinder players will see in Player Core 2 coming out in July. DC20 also has a version of the Commander, which Pathfinder players have seen in a playtest released uh, last month for the new Battlecry book coming out in 2025. So 
Both of these versions are based off of the Warlord from 4th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Paladins in DC-20, or Champions in Pathfinder, have been removed in favor of the Spellblade, which was a stretch goal unlocked extremely early in the Kickstarter. Multiclassing is the same in DC-20 as Pathfinder. You continue to gain levels in your primary class, but you take talents of another class as you level up at specific intervals. Talents are basically what Pathfinder would call feats for you know a better understanding of that kind of mechanic. Ancestries are the species or races of DC-20. The word's the same in both Pathfinder and DC-20, but that is pretty much where the similarities end. Now, ancestries such as elf, dwarf, human, etc., are all very standard across multiple RPGs. DC-20 has a wide variety of ancestries and will be adding more as time goes on. Although the names are a bit different for some, Players will have no issue with the concept for them, such as, you know, the Dragonborn from 5e. Angelborn or Fiendborn, which DC-20 uses born a ton in their ancestries, are just the Pathfinder Nephilim. Beastborn and DC-20 are the awakened animals similar to Howl of the Wild, and so on and so on. The big difference is that you get five ancestry points to purchase your ancestral traits, and you can mix and match them with other ancestries to give you your mixed races. Now, in my previous video, I could not remember where I saw the point purchases before, and several of you reminded me in the comments of my previous video that this was an option in the Skills and Powers book for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which I then pulled off my shelf, dusted off, and had a great time reading over it again. I haven't cracked that cover in a couple decades or longer. Backgrounds will give you five skill points, three trade points, and two language points. Now this is very different from Pathfinder as you do not buy your skills or crafting, but you use your proficiencies and your level automatically adds to the modifier. In DC 20, you use skill points to buy mastery levels, which are very much like proficiency levels in Pathfinder. Skills in DC 20 have five levels in the book, although you can go higher than that stated through traits, talents, class features, etc. You are restricted to what mastery limit you can have by level, which again is very much like Pathfinder. Now there is no untrained level as there is in Pathfinder. DC 20 uses a novice, which caps at level one, adept at level five, expert at level 10, master at level 15, and Grandmaster all the way up at level 20. Each of these levels gives you a plus two just like in Pathfinder, but you can gain up to eight levels of mastery with talents, classes, abilities, etc. There is an example in the alpha of having eight mastery levels giving you a plus 16 to a check. Languages is a very odd mechanic in it where you have one mastery level you are not fluent at the specific language and you must make a check to speak or read or write where if you have a mastery level of two gives you fluency. Now, I'm not sure I think this really needs to be in the game, to be very honest. It doesn't add anything to the game other than possible frustration for the players. Uh, I'll be scrapping this in any game I run. I just don't find it a mechanic that, that adds anything. Now, combat mastery, which dictates things like attacks, spell casting, saves, etc., is just one half of your level rounded up. As far as I know, you cannot increase this in any way that I've seen, and that is to keep the game balanced. Now, this is a main divergence from Pathfinder's proficiency scaling. Speaking of combat, DC-20 runs very much like Pathfinder, with a few exceptions. During initiative, the player's role versus an initiative DC that the GM sets. If any of the players beat that number, then that player will go first. But then a creature controlled by the GM will kind of slot in. Then the player with the next highest check and back and forth. So this is extremely similar to tabletop war games such as War Machine or Warhammer. We called it a you go, I go system. The players then take their turn by initiative order as they rolled with their opponents sprinkled in between. Now the opponents, again, do not roll initiative. So once the GM sets the opponents in their order, they do not change either. So the GM does not get to have this huge tactical advantage by being able to swap the monsters in their initiative order each round. That would be really bad. So in Pathfinder, it defaults to perception, but it could be any skill uh, check such as stealth or uh, diplomacy or anything like that. And it really depends on what your players were doing at the time you call for initiative. In DC 20, this is the same, but if the player is not ready for combat, such as the example that they state in the alpha of the bard just plucking their loot 
it could be a flat d20 check as well. The GM can determine what should be rolled per PC. Again, as the NPC is just going between the players, there is no rule for them. If the PCs gain a critical success by beating the DC set by the GM by five or more, two PCs get to go before an NPC. As well, if the PCs have tied initiative and they both beat that DC, both of them go at the same time. If the PC also gets the critical success, they gain advantage on a single check during the first turn of combat. Now, if anyone gets a critical failure, because remember, this is a DC check, then they actually go last in the order and the first attack against them has advantage. That's a very interesting way to do it. Now, speaking of critical successes and critical failures, Pathfinder 2E players will understand this concept extremely well. DC 20 uses a five point scale for critical successes and failures. In Pathfinder, if you succeed or fail by 10, that can trigger a critical result. And in DC 20 combat, hitting by five or 10 or more adds to the damage you do instead of bonus dice. And I'll talk about this in a little bit. Let's look at combat, as this is where most Pathfinder players will see the base mechanics merge. DC 20 uses a four action point plus a minor action point system. These points refresh at the end of your turn, not when you start. When combat begins, everyone gets their action points to the max of four. And yes, apparently there are instances where you can have less than four for reasons. Now this allows you to react when it's not your turn at the cost of being able to do actions during your turn. Now there are some slight differences such as if you use an action point to move, you do get your full movement and can break that movement up with another action such as attacking. Now this is a 5e mechanic that has been brought over. Movement in DC 20 is just spaces, not feet or anything. And there are no penalties for diagonal movement as there are in Pathfinder. A minor action is something like opening a door, drawing a weapon, or other things that you think would take a very small amount of time. Most spells take two actions, it's very much similar to Pathfinder. In combat, there's also no multiple attack penalty like there is in Pathfinder. So in Pathfinder, if you use another action point to use the same attack action again, you suffer a minus five or minus four, and then a minus 10 or minus eight if you're using a third attack action in a round. In DC 20, they use the advantage and disadvantage mechanic of 5e, but it can stack. So if you attack, you use it the base 20 plus your prime modifier. If you attack a second time, you roll 2d20, take the lowest result, then add your modifiers. So in DC 20, you can also expend more action points to do a single thing and actually gain advantage as well, which is much different than Pathfinder where a single action is for a single thing and nothing more. Now in DC 20, there are not many things that do use multiple action points that I've seen so far, unless the GM states that they should. And yes, there are some examples where casting a ritual, for instance, could take up multiple rounds and cost more than four action points. Now there are pages of things you can do with action points that I will not be covering. Otherwise this video would be way too long. Suffice it to say that if you come from Pathfinder, you'll see many, many similarities for things such as they call maneuvers, talents, etc. Things such as raising a shield, a combat insight, which is what we in Pathfinder call a recall knowledge check, a uh, pass through, which is a tumble through in Pathfinder, uh, using a power attack, uh, using a takedown, knockback, parry, and others are pulled right from Pathfinder into DC 20 and then reworked for their game mechanics. Skills such as hide allow you to be unseen or hidden, which is rolled against the passive awareness of all the creatures. This is the same mechanic in Pathfinder where you roll stealth versus the perception DC of the creatures. Opportunity attacks are only for those with martial classes in DC 20, very much akin to Pathfinder, where not everyone or everything has an opportunity attack, like in 5e. Now this uses one or more of your action points, and then you'd only have three or less remaining to, at the start of your turn. So fun note that I will cover in another video, but casters can also take an opportunity attack of sorts when they, when an opponent casts a spell, they can launch what is called a spell duel for two action points. Now there are some concepts in DC 20 that are not either 5e or Pathfinder. One of the most glaring things is damage. In DC 20, a spell deals a static number. And then depending on your talents, maneuvers, and your hit roll success, that number increases. Health points, or hit points that we know in 
Pathfinder, are very, very low in this game. A character in DC 20 starts with six plus their level plus might and then possibly ancestry or class bonus hit, uh, hit points, health points. So this is a very low hit point game compared to Pathfinder where our seventh level fighter has 99 hit points already. The other combat thing is resistances and vulnerabilities. They can have a static number like they do in Pathfinder or it can be half or immune, just like in Pathfinder. Now, armor is a bit different as well. Armor is either light or heavy, depending on the quality, and that's being novice, adept, or expert, which I would honestly rename something like low, mid, and master crafted quality, just because, well, naming. They give some bonuses to your physical defense, and heavy armor gives you physical damage reduction. No armor has an agility penalty, but heavy armor requires a might of one to wear. Similar to medium and heavy armor in Pathfinder needing a certain strength score to wear without penalties to speed and other skills. Shields, like in Pathfinder, need to be raised to give a bonus to your physical defense, and the bonus is either one or two. Fun side note, someone on the team must absolutely love Captain America as much as I do, as the round shield has the throne trait. That's awesome. That thing does not obey the laws of physics at all. Now, we don't have costs of equipment in the alpha, but we do see a glimpse of how the economy is going to work because it'll be very much like Pathfinder. So in the potion chart, a first level healing potion costs 10 gold pieces. A fifth level potion, which is the highest one in the alpha, costs only 100 gold pieces. Again, this is just an alpha and I can see this being reworked as the crafting system comes into the next betas in the future. And I did watch one of Dungeon Coach's Kickstarter live streams where he stated that everything will have a crafting value from swords and armor to magic items. And that is in line with Pathfinder as well. How the crafting will be done is not known by anyone outside of their team, but they're obviously working on it. So this seems to be a low coin economy. Lastly, let's look at the conditions in Pathfinder and DC 20. Many have the same names and do some of the same basic mechanics, but as the system uses advantage and disadvantage, many revolve around that. The one thing that Pathfinder players will notice is if there's a number behind the condition, that number affects the condition, such as exhaustion two, means that you subtract two from all your D20 rolls. Now, conditions can stack in DC 20, as with Pathfinder, and some conditions just refer to other conditions, like in Pathfinder. An example in DC 20 is restrained. If you are restrained, you are then hindered, exposed, and grappled. Luckily, the description does give you the Coles notes of what each of these things do to you. And if you're Canadian, you'll likely get that reference. Now, I think that's the gist of the similarities and differences with the two systems. So if you're coming over from Pathfinder, you may find way more similarities to DC 20 than those who are just coming over from D&D 5e. There are, of course, new mechanics that both groups will have to learn, but it is not insurmountable, nor should be overly complex for any good GM that reads the rules before running the game. If there are other things that I may have missed, let me know in the comments. If you're a Pathfinder player, are you thinking about giving DC 20 a shot? What are some other concepts from Pathfinder you would like to see brought over? Now remember that the alpha is only a very small tease of what is to come, but maybe some ideas could end up being ported over if they have not already been done so by the DC 20 team. Well, that's it for me. And I will see all of you in my next video. If you're enjoying the content and want to see more, please remember to hit the like and subscribe button, ring that bell for notifications, and leave a comment below, or hey, just throw your favorite emoji and hit share to help this video in the infamous YouTube algorithm. In the meantime, and in between time, may all your games be full of myth, mirth, and magic. Bye for now.